Virginia. I'm Pastor Brad Winnegar. This is the last Sunday night of 2021. It's December the 26th, our regular Sunday evening service. And uh, this, of course, is the day after Christmas, but we're looking forward to our time coming up on uh, the new year 2022. God has opportunities for me and you in 2022. We want to take advantage of those spiritual opportunities tonight. As we begin, welcoming everybody who's here and those that are viewing online. God bless each and every one of you who trust that you had a Christ-honoring Christmas. And tonight we'd like to read something from the Psalms. Would you turn with me to the hymn book of the Hebrew people? And it is inspired, every syllable of it, Psalm 19 and verse number 1. Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. That's amazing. God's fingerprints are all over His creation. And tonight we look forward to finding out who God is. The Bible tells us who God is, but He is revealed He's revealed in several ways. We're going to see this tonight. So as we welcome you, we ask you now to take your burgundy hymnal, if you would, to, uh, with me and turn to number 365 in your burgundy hymnal. And let's stand together and sing, How Great Thou Art. Amen. My God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Sing it out with me now. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sing my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Acclamation, sing it. How great 
thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Yes, how great God is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this opening song and the truth of it. Thank you for the scripture that we read. Thank you that your fingerprints are all over your creation. And Lord, I pray that it may make us realize how dependent we are upon our great God. Thank you for condescending. Thank you for coming down from glory and for saving our souls and giving us a life worth living. I pray now for every person who is viewing. I pray that those that will be viewing in the future, may be drawn to you. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And we like to wish everyone a belated Merry Christmas, a blessed Merry Christmas. And of course, today we had this wonderful reminder of those wise men, the Magi, who came from afar and uh, bowed down and worshipped our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not when he was in the manger, but after he was a small child and was in a house in Bethlehem, as the Scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 2. With the gifts that were given, we have symbolized the earthly ministry of our Savior, who is prophet, priest, and king. And we're reminded also of the privilege, the high and holy privilege which is ours, to represent this king. And someday all knees will bow, all tongues will confess, but right now we have the privilege of doing that ourselves. And we are very, very thankful for the opportunity. I want to say a special word of thanks to each and every one of you for your faithfulness this past year, actually these past several years, with the limitations that we have had placed on us by uh, health restraints and other things that have happened with the crowd being somewhat diminished in person, but actually increasing online. Praise the Lord for each and every viewer, each and every participant. But we are, we are on the upswing, and we are planning right now for great things that God is going to do in 2022. How many of you believe that God can and that God will do great things? I do, and I'm very thankful to be a part of this. We do have to express our dependence upon God. And so tonight I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles again. Take that Bible again if you would please. And let's turn in the Bible to the 19th chapter of the Psalms. The Psalms, the 19th chapter. As you're turning there, let me just remind you that in each of our ministries over a half a century of time, I have taught through the book of Psalms verse by verse to all of my people. And it is certainly the uh, hymn book, the inspired hymn book of the Hebrews, but also it is known as humanity's hymn book. That is, every one of the human conditions is touched upon and addressed in Scripture. And we know what we need to know from the Word of God. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. I believe there are no mistakes in it. And God helping me, as the Spirit of God guides me into all truth, I'm going to try to obey the Word of God. One of the things that each and every person here should attempt in the year 2022 is to read through the Bible and to get into the Word until the Word gets into you. How many of you are going to try to read through the Bible at least one time in 2022? And uh, you can do like Brother Tom. God bless you, Brother Tom. I'm sure you're going to be viewing this. If you're not viewing it live, he usually does. Brother Tom Higgins, last year, he, he texted me after he had read through the Bible, I think it was three or four times uh, in that calendar year. And he did one a reading through the entire Bible in a very short space of time. I think it was 30 days. And I asked him how he did it, and he showed me the number of psalms, and he gave me the plan for that. Now, it's not, it's not a speed contest, and it's not an endurance uh, contest, but it is a matter of, of discipline. This is the living 
breathing Word of God. We ought to respect it and honor it. And so do that. And um, even though we are very busy, we're trying every day to read the Scriptures together as well as reading them separately, reading through the Bible. I hope that you will do the same in 2022. Get a head start right now. If you'll read two chapters in the Old Testament and one chapter in the New Testament every day, Monday through Saturday, and then on Sunday, read three chapters in the Old Testament and two chapters in the New. You'll finish in mid to late December. So that's the way to get it done. So uh, three chapters on weekdays and five chapters on Sunday, and you'll get it done. So let's be faithful. Let's catch up if we're behind and do the very best that we possibly can. The Bible also says in this important book, the book of Psalms, two times. Psalm 14, 1 and Psalm 53, 1. We're not going to turn there. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Some of you are aware of the tragedy of apostate children of preachers. And we see it and we hear about it all the time and it is a shock. And we have heard about Abraham Piper, who is the uh, 20-something-year-old uh, son of John Piper. John Piper is a Baptist pastor, uh, Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're not in full agreement on doctrine and practice, but he is a man of God, and uh, as such, he should be respected. His son has taken to uh, TikTok or one of those other um, outlets, and he, uh, for two minutes or a minute or three minutes, whatever, he will mock his father. He will mock the gospel. He will mock the word of God. And it's such a shame. I, I need to remind uh, Abraham Piper of the destiny of those who say in their heart there is no God. But he says stupid things. I saw the print of, of uh, some of the things he says. And the greatest theologians of our day basically and very dryly say this. Even though Abraham Piper is famous because of his father, that's the only reason he's famous. And even though he's very glib, he's like a lot of millennials. He can talk, but excuse me, millennials, I'm not saying this of all millennials. Millennials can talk. They have the language, but they don't always say anything. Okay, am, am I right on that? They, they, they talk, but they don't always, they, they can glibly speak. And Abraham Piper can speak very glibly, but he's not always saying something. He starts off and he says, well, Jesus was a thief. And he says, you know, he took that, took that colt and, and uh, why they let that colt go, I'll never know, but just so he could ride into Jerusalem and look humble. And he said, and, and he, he was a destroyer. Uh, why? He killed all those pigs. And the reason he killed those pigs now, here's what he says. Here's how he accuses Jesus. The reason he killed all those pigs is because if they were keeping pigs, they couldn't have been Jews. And he hated everybody that wasn't a Jew. And so that's why he killed their pigs. Now, would you agree with me, just based on that little sampling that I've given you, that Abraham Piper may be a very glib speaker and may have a following of hundreds of thousands. And, and by the way, people that are on YouTube and that are on the air or whatever, that have thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of followers, I wonder why sometimes. But even though he may have a lot of followers, he's not saying a whole lot. He's not saying anything new. And the theologians who have critiqued him have said, you know what? He just proves the Bible. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Playing the fool. Ray Comfort is a Christian author, and he's hooked up with Kirk Cameron, and uh, they have a, a ministry together. But he has made a statement about street preaching and, and about open-air preaching. He says there's not a lot of places. Of course, he doesn't know my street preacher friends. They'll find a place. They'll find a public place. They'll preach on the street. But uh, he found a place, Ray Comfort found a place to preach where he has a captive audience. He goes across the street from his ministry, and they're lined up in line at the courthouse to go in and make their appearance. So he just stands across from me. He says, my name's Ray Comfort. I'm neighborhood pastor here. I'd just like to have permission to speak to you. And then another one of his people walks up and down the line and passes out little helps that say, when you go in there, you have to turn off your cell phone. 
or they'll kick you out and you've got to do this and you can't do that and so on and so forth. But then it's got the gospel on it too. And I say, amen and, and hooray for Ray Comfort on that. But he's speaking to them and he said, uh, he said uh, you are here because you have allegedly violated civil law. The Bible alleges that each of us have violated God's law, the Ten Commandments. So I'd like to put you on the stand, cross-examine you for a moment under the light of the law, and then let you make the call as to whether you are innocent or guilty. I then went through the law and the reality of hell. I explained that, explained that confessing their sins to God on Judgment Day isn't going to help them then. I told them that it was like saying to the judge that they were about to face judge. I confess I committed the crime. I'm sorry. The judge would probably say, so you are admitting your guilt? Then you should be sorry and we'll have no problem paying up for you've broken the law. See, just saying that you're guilty doesn't get you anywhere, does it? No, somebody's got to pay the price. That's where Jesus comes in. I explained, Ray Comfort says, that they needed to, someone to pay their fine. I told them about the cross, repentance, faith in Jesus. I closed by telling them that my ministry partner is Kirk Cameron, whom they might remember from TV and from the movies. We'd like to give you a book about his latest uh, work that will help you in your walk with God. Please take it as I walk past you. And so they did that. So he kept on doing that, kept on doing that. And then he said, one day an angry gentleman called out, I'm going to exercise my First Amendment rights. Who the blank are you? I said, my name is Ray. And I was about to stir him a little, as I'd done for years when faced with hecklers. And then I realized that I already had a crowd. I didn't need to do so. And then this discontented, dissatisfied customer said, I'm going to call the police. <laughs> but he didn't say a word after that because he must have realized that he wasn't in a good position to call the law since he was on his way to court for violating the law himself. As we walked past and offered the free book, he didn't even look up because he was busy reading the tract that my associate had given to him previously. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You have to be a fool, a mocker, to doubt the reality of God, who he is, who the Bible says he is. My friend now in heaven, evangelist Clyde Kendall, used to begin every message with the Ten Commandments. Didn't matter what he was preaching on. He would start with the Ten Commandments. He'd go through it. And he, he said, got to get them lost. And so he'd go through the Ten Commandments, and he, and he would say, invariably, you were there, you heard him. He would, he would say, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt. And he went through the Ten Commandments, and he said, everybody here has broken the Ten Commandments. We're all guilty before God. And so we're going to have to pay the price. And that's where we are tonight. We're looking at what our greatest need is and what the Scripture reveals. Would you follow with me as once again I read what it says in Psalm 19. This is a psalm of David, a psalm of David. And in this psalm, by inspiration, David is revealing God. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. The first six verses, we see God revealed by His works, by creation, by what He has formed, by what He has done. There it is, by what he has formed. The heavens here refers to the created heavens. And there are actually three heavens. Mark this down. There are three heavens in Scripture, not five, not seven. Uh, you know, they talk about seventh heaven. There's only three heavens in the Scripture. There is that, uh, that heaven that surrounds our earth, and we know it as the atmosphere, and later on it's called the firmament. That's the first heaven. And the second heaven is the stellar heaven. That's, that's out beyond our atmosphere, everything that goes till the end of creation. And then there is the third heaven, which is the heaven into which Paul, when he was stoned, uh, entered and saw and heard things that were not lawful for him to repeat. And the third heaven is where God and the heavenly host reside. That's it. Satan has access there, by the way. He can go into the third heaven, but his dwelling is here in the firmament. So the heavens declare the glory of God. How is it that the heavens declare the glory of God? The heavens declare the glory of God because of what they are. There is no way that what's out there could have just happened. There is no way 
that what is out there could have been a mere accident or like dominoes uh, hitting one another and as the end result of those dominoes somehow inadvertently having been started and now we have those heavens out there. Everything that is out there is by design and for a purpose. And though I don't know and you don't know and nobody knows, even those that are looking through the Hubble and so on and so forth, uh, can see some things they couldn't see previously, we still don't know why everything is out there except to generalize and say it, these are the fingerprints of God. I don't know how anybody can be a true scientist and doubt the existence of God and doubt the validity of of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. They're, they're telling us something. They're telling us uh, something that we need to know. And the firmament, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Now the word for firmament pictures something that started out as a certain size but then got squeezed or squashed or stretched so thin it's like a mirror surface. And that's the firmament around our earth. That's the atmosphere around our earth. It testifies to the reality of God. Only God could have done that. What is it that keeps us from flying off the planet? What is it that keeps the atmosphere from totally dissipating? And even though those eco-freaks can scream about how we're destroying the atmosphere, and yet it seems... It seems to be repaired. It seems to be, after a period of time, it seems to be okay, even better than before. Why is that? That's because God is the one who created it. God's signature is on it. And that's why it's as excellent as it is. Now we have a continuous picture here. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. What a declaration this is to declare to praise the glory of God. That's what, that's what the firmament and that's what our calendar day unto day and night unto night tell. We have a separation between day and night here as we do throughout Scripture. Did you notice in the creation account, day and night are separated and there is a symbolism. There is a, a picture of something which is insidious with the night and something which is glorious with the bright light. And, and God uses night to depict the lostness, the hopelessness, the despair, the darkness of man's spirit. But he, he uses the light to picture what we can have, what we can have given to us by God's gracious gift. Through verses uh, 1 through 6, we have the name for God Elohim, or short for Elohim, El. And then in verses 7 through 14, we have another name, Yahweh. We have Jehovah, which is the covenant name, the relationship name of God. And it's good to watch these things when we're studying the Word of God, to know that God is speaking as Creator and His declaration through His creation in the first six verses. And then there's something very special that even though we've got the general signature of God on creation, now God narrows it down and focuses it very sharply because in verses 7 through 12, we have a God who loves relationship, who desires us to be His people. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. This is the silent witness of God's creation, and we no, as it says in verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth. We've read in Romans chapter 10 and verse 18 that, that the, the knowledge of God has been worldwide in previous generations. But we are responsible for this generation. And even though people in the past had uh, some kind of an understanding of, of the fact that there is a God, and there's less and less of that because of the wickedness, the iniquity of our age, yet we're without excuse we have the gospel. We have the truth. We need to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I have my hand on the globe here. I know of two churches that have a, a globe on the platform next to the pulpit. One is the one I previously pastored, and the other one is this one. Now, there may be more, but I know that for a fact, that our emphasis upon missions never diminishes. We have 
the wall of heroes that we walk past every week out here. And those faces that are out there on the field by faith and are supported 100% by the, the heartfelt gifts by faith of God's people. Think about that. And yet they've been sustained out there on the mission field, some of them 30 and 40 years and more. So their line has gone out throughout the, all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. The line speaks of a boundary, a measurement, but here it's an unlimited measure. And the truth, the truth is out there if we are open to it. The truth is out there for lost people and they have the potential to receive it. When the light is displayed to somebody in a primitive situation, if they're true to that light, God honors that with more light and more light. And eventually, often some mission conference in some little corner of some church somewhere, somewhere where, where the a commission, the great commission is being preached, why some, somebody surrenders to the mission field and they go and they reach the people who are saying, I want to know this God whose fingerprints are on all the creation around me which is as a bridegroom. That word as indicates that this is a metaphor. This is a simile. Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. We've recently sent one of our spacecraft into the outer ridge of the sun. And uh, we've gotten some data back. Uh, nothing that is so earth-shaking that you're going to fall out of your chair. But what they learned was it's really hot. And yes, it is really hot out there. Absolutely. God has placed us in the creation in exactly the right place. If we were any further from the sun, we would freeze. If we were any closer, we would fry. He has placed us in the ideal situation on this planet that He prepared for man who He created after His own image. We're special to God. We don't deserve it, but we are. We should acknowledge that. So we have, we have uh, the Son likened to a bridegroom coming out of His chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. We have um, the going forth from the end of it of the heaven is circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The circuit speaks of, uh, of that period of time that you and I call a year. Now you'd say there's 365 days. Actually, there's 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds. But who's counting? That's why, yes, <laughs> you say... Really, is that true? There was a fellow back in ancient Greece, uh, Aristothenes. Aristothenes? I don't know Aristothenes, never met him. But he is the first one to suggest the necessity of a leap year. And not every four years, but every four years, and then uh, uh, skipping uh, certain centuries so that it will come out exactly right. He, in ancient Greece, came up with 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds. Think about that. You say, why? He must have been pretty smart. Not nearly as smart as God who put it all together. You see, what we call science is just discovery of how great God is. Whether, wh whatever classification of animal or plant life we're talking about, all of that science is just recognition of who God is. God knows exactly what he's doing. And so uh, God already knew before I ever had that fantastic meal this noon, sweetheart, that you prepared. He knew exactly uh, the source of the food that I ate and what classification it was and how many calories and how many carbs and how many grams and how many whatever was in that. And praise the Lord, he knows more than I'll ever know or ever could know. And I'm dependent upon him. When we think about everything that God is doing all the time, all the balance, do you know that as we're standing here on this spot, you're sitting on that spot, there are at least seven different motions going on at once that impact you on this planet. Did you ever think about that? Speeding through space, I mean, all of these things going on at once. 
And yet you say, I can walk from here to here and I don't have to balance like I'm on a ship at sea or I'm flying through the air at some horrific speed. But instead, it's all in God's hands. I'm very thankful I've got a God like that who is big enough to control the entire universe and yet He cares about me. And He wants me to, to walk right, do right, live right, eat right, sleep right. All of those things are important to Him. And for some people, God cares so much more about them than they care about themselves. They would be self-destructing all the time if God were not intervening. Think about that. Has God ever intervened in your life? Has He kept you from self-destruction? That's our God. So the Son is like a bridegroom coming out of His chamber. That's kind of personal, but, you know, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. You know, He's, he's all energetic, all excited up and going, and is going forth, runs that circuit. That's all of God's creation. So put it down, number one, verses one through six. God is revealed by His works, by His creation, by what He has formed, by what He sustains, by, by being the creator, the sustainer of the universe. And that's the God we serve, and that's the God who cares about us. Now, verses 7 through 12, God is revealed in His Word, in, in the foundational truths of the Bible. There it is. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, all of this scripture that we're looking at gives attention to the Word of God that's inspired and preserved. Six different statements are given here, each containing a, a name for God's special revelation, an attribute. Here we have, we have in verse 7, the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord speaks of order. And even if it weren't personal, and, and it is, and even if it weren't uh, His precious Word that, that warms us and keeps us, it is, it is good even for lost people. Now, I wish they'd get saved, but until they get saved, the law of God is, is good for them too for two reasons. First of all, God is a God of order and He doesn't let us destroy everything. All that creation we just read about is under His control and He's a God of special order. But also that law is there to show us our need of a Savior as lost sinners. Romans 3.20, Romans 7.7, 7, Mark 10.21, all of them tell us that we are lost and we're not ready for the gospel until we realize that we're lost and that we need someone to pay the price. Otherwise, we're going to have to pay the price. God is revealed in and through His Word, which is foundational truth. It is absolute truth. Wicked people are revealed by it as well. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, the simple are those who haven't yet been confirmed anything. They're open to truth, but they just they haven't got it settled. And so you have to take the simple. I'm talking about these little kids that come in on the bus. I'm talking about teenagers in the youth group. I'm talking about family members who haven't yet come to an understanding of foundational truth. That's why God puts us in their life to help them. And they may say later on, man, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Well, thank God your kids can't do what they want to do. They would self-destruct. They would destroy all your stuff and their stuff and themselves with it. The statutes of the Lord, another, another attribute. Here we go. Our right, rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Mark this down. Fine gold is purified gold. It's much more valuable because it's pure. And guess what else is pure? This book that we call the Bible, the Word of God, is pure. It's fine like fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Now, the honey that's referred to here is the honey that oozes out of the honeycomb, and because it oozes out by itself, it is the purest of the honey. Think about that. And so that's what we've got, something that is solid, solid, like rock solid, and yet it's that which is so sweet, and it redeems us. Think about that. 
Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. You see the connection there? If I've got secret faults, unconfessed sin in my life that's allowed to fester and do its worst damage, then I am not going to be hearing from God what I need to hear. I'm not going to be able to ascertain the perfect will of God. I'm going to get myself deeper and deeper into problems. So there it is. God is revealed in and through His Word, which is foundational truth. I want to come to the last two verses here, and I want us to look at these. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, my rock, in other words, my redeemer, the one who has bought us back. That 14th verse is especially precious to me. My grandfather on my mom's side, that is my mom's dad, that was his life's verse. He used to sign it when he'd sign his name, when he'd sign his cards that he'd send his correspondence. And uh, he used to quote it all the time. And my mother, as a result, my mother who's now in heaven, was a wonderful, wonderful uh, memorizer of Scripture. And she memorized this entire psalm. And she would come to that 14th verse and she'd be just, I mean, just a moving through it, fast speed. Even when she was 100 years old, I heard her quote this. And she'd say, And my dear dad in heaven now all these years, His verse was, let the words of my mouth. Now, David's writing this, but you can personalize it. And the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. It's personal. It's personal. That means we belong to God. Look at me. 24-7, 365. Well, 365, 5 hours, 48 minutes, 46 seconds. We're His constantly. We need to be reminded of that. And so the psalmist, David, is saying, Lord, would you let the words that come out of my mouth always be the right kind of words? Don't we need to pray that? The words that I speak to others, let them build up and not tear down. Let the words that I speak be positive and not negative. Let the words that I speak be a help and a blessing and be the absolute truth and not just a bunch of junk. Abraham Piper, I'm not picking on him tonight. I feel so bad for him. He's apostatized not once but twice. He was was kicked out of his dad's church and then he came back, supposedly repented, and then he apostatized again. I feel so bad for him. I feel sorry for his parents. I know we're all sinners, and I know we have to bear responsibility for what we raise in this world. But I don't believe his parents deserve that. I don't believe his dad's church and ministry deserve that. Yet Abraham Piper does not say, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. No, he says Jesus was a thief. Jesus was a destroyer. What a tragedy. What a tragic thing. I'm sure there are days and nights when John Piper thinks back to when Abraham was just a little boy and he made that profession of faith the first time. And then how he apostatized and how dad's and mom's heart were broken and they... They had to discipline him out of the church, out of the fellowship. But then he came back and how their hearts were lifted up just to be let down again. And now, and now the wicked, horrible things he says, mocking his family's faith and the truth of the Word of God. That makes me that much more determined to see that these young ones that are coming up have a solid foundation. Amen. That our people have something to take home. This morning, as I first started out, you remember I read from Revelation chapter 1, and then I I gave the outline of Revelation in verse 19 of chapter 1, and then I said, how many of you learned something? The hands went all up, all over the place. And you know what that did for me? 
that did me good. That made me feel good. What is it that causes a person to fall into such horrible sin? The same thing that caused Lucifer to fall and take one-third of the heavenly host with him. It's called pride. Pride. It's so destructive. So destructive. When I read about the soul of mankind, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament is nephesh. Nephesh, which refers to the totality of the individual. It's who you are. It's everything about you put together. It's the whole package. That's it. That's it. And the nephesh, the nephesh is the person that's going to live or exist forever somewhere. I'm glad that we have those six expressions of the Word of God and how they impact us differently. Because you see, tomorrow... I'm going to need one of those or several of those. And the next day, I'm going to need one or several of those. And what I go through and how I need the Lord will require all of the multifaceted blessings of the Word of God. I am dependent upon God Almighty. His great power revealed in creation has now been focused on helping me to be all that I ought to be and all that you ought to be. And somebody who has turned on God and turned their back on God still needs the Lord. God still loves them, although God can't do anything for them until they will repent, until they will will be turned, as the Scripture says. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins, presumptuous sins, sins of pride where the person refuses. I'm thinking about the person who, before they ever got saved, thought, I don't want to, I don't want to go down front. What will people think of me? And so they refuse to go down and receive the Lord as Savior And so they go on in their unsaved condition until one day something happens and it breaks them down and they they come to church and they can't wait for the invitation and they come and they get saved. And, And then as someone is counseling them, they show them how the next step of obedience is to be immersed. They say, what, wet all over in front of everybody? And once again, the sin of pride, the presumptuous sin takes hold and they say, I don't want to be baptized. I don't want to be doing that in front of people. And we can go on and on through the various experiences that we have, steps of obedience that we need to be taking for the Lord. We need to be out and out for the Lord. And wherever we hold back and we put the brakes on, that's where the blessings of God cease. And that's where we become a a great big target for the world, the flesh, and the devil. Keep back, hold me back. Hold back thy servant. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. When God created everything in six 24-hour days, he then said to man, to, man, to Adam, said, you, you take the garden, you dress it, and you have dominion over creation. He was to be a steward. He was to be a manager of God's creation. What an honor that was. And what did he do? When first tempted, Adam and Eve succumbed to the temptation and they did what they were told not to do. Let them, let the sins not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. There it is. Very simply, very basically stated, we don't want sin to do its wicked work ever so steadily, ever so deadly behind the scenes. During the great preaching days of Charles Haddon Spurgeon at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, 
across town there was another great preacher. And he was not uh, as uh, deep as Spurgeon. He was considered more of a common man's preacher. His name was Joseph Parker. He was a good preacher. I have a collection of his messages. Whereas Charles Haddon Spurgeon would have three, four, five, six, seven main points and some subpoints. Joseph Parker, kind of a stream of consciousness preacher. He was a little bit like A.W. Tozer uh, was uh, in the next century, the 20th century. But Joseph Parker, Parker used to give a lot of illustrations, like, uh, like Talmadge up in Brooklyn. Talmadge was kind of like, uh, oh, the Jerry Falwell Sr. of his day. Well, Joseph Parker was that way. He would use examples. And he was giving a vivid description of how when he traveled to the interior of darkest Africa, some of the things that happened, some of the things that occurred, they, they had wild game, they had, uh, uh, they had yet undiscovered tribes that had never been seen by people from the outside, and all kinds of things that happened. And he said, and I got to this village deep in the interior. And we were talking about the things to watch out for. Now, some things are obvious, right? And he was, he was telling it this way. He was saying, you know, you got to watch out for those charging elephants. Now, you don't have to tell me twice. I think I would hear them coming. I think I would see them before they got to me. You know, you got to stay out of the water when the rhinos and, and the, all the critters are in the water. You got you to gotta watch out for, for, the, uh, for the lions. And, uh, and when they're hungry and they're roaring, you know, they're, they're doing their, you got to watch out. But then somebody said through interpreter, said there's something you have to watch out for that's even deadlier because of how they work. Joseph Parker said, what's that? What kind of creature could this be? And they gave a name, and then they translated, and they said, white ants, white ants. And Joseph Parker went on to describe how you could be sitting in one of their huts that was constructed from the trees and the mud and the straw and so forth, and they were sitting in the hut, and you could be having a conversation, and all of a sudden, the entire thing would fall down. And the reason it would fall down is because ever so silently, those tiny white ants had bored through the material that the hut was made of. And you could be in the midst, you could be mid-sentence, and all of a sudden the whole hut would fall down on you. He said, you got to watch out for those white ants. Let me tell you tonight, you know, we can see and hear the elephants coming. We can hear the roar of the lion. Uh, we can hear the noises off there in the water. and We can avoid all the big critters, everybody who's trying to destroy us and have us for lunch. But you cannot see the white ants until it's too late. And that's what secret sins, presumptuous sins do in the life of of the believer. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Every head bowed. You've been viewing a service at Central Baptist Church. We never dismiss the service without clearly presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is that Jesus came to this earth and sinlessly lived for 33 years before he voluntarily gave his life. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose from the dead and he's alive forevermore. Through the shedding of his blood and through his victory at uh, the, the empty tomb, Jesus Christ now offers salvation to you. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray right now from your heart to God and ask him to save you? Something like this, Dear God, just pray, Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. I believe Jesus died to save me. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. 
Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? Wonderful. I want you to get in contact with us and let us know of your decision. Now, if you've already been saved, I want to encourage you to live the life that God would have you to live according to His Word. If you desire more instruction, more information, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We like to talk to you. The information is right here, and we'd love to speak to you. If you have any spiritual needs whatsoever, may God bless you.